Welcome to the Skillick Explains Finance video. This week, a big topic, Bitcoin basics again, how Bitcoin futures work. We've seen exchanges introducing these new contracts, making the market potentially open to institutional players. So, what are these all about? What are the pros and cons? Now, it takes two to tango. There's gonna be some jargon here. So, Tim Bull thinks the price of Bitcoins will rise. Zoe Bear thinks the price of Bitcoin will fall. It takes two people to make a market. And one of the criticisms of the Bitcoin market is there's no obvious way for people who think the price will fall to actually bet on it. Now, betting on something falling when it's in a bubble, as arguably I'd say Bitcoin is, is an incredibly dangerous thing to do. So don't try this at home. This is merely explaining what the futures market is all about. So choices available to Tim. Buy Bitcoin, see if the price rises. But as you'll see in a moment, with futures, you get something called leverage. All right, and that is what is attracting some of the institutional money into this market. Buy Bitcoin ETFs, just for completeness. Buy spread bets and CFDs. These all come with individual risks or buy Bitcoin futures. Now, not everyone can do that fourth option, but I want to explain, since that's the thing that's sort of breaking news at the moment, what's going on there. For Zoe, just don't buy. If you think the price is going to fall, just stay out of the market. Spread bet or use CFDs, sell Bitcoin futures. Just to remind you, this sort of stuff is incredibly dangerous in the wrong hands. All right, so on we go. Now, buyers versus sellers. So what we're going to do now is set up a small example of a futures market. So what have we got? We've got Tim, who is the long. That's just jargon for wants to bet on rising prices, essentially. Zoe is the short, betting on falling prices. And in the middle, an exchange. Now, at the moment, we've got two, Chicago Board Options Exchange and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. There are rumours others, like the Nasdaq Exchange, may join the party fairly soon. So here we go. Tim is going to buy five Bitcoin futures. Zoe is going to sell Bitcoin futures. In the futures market, a bit like the actual Bitcoin market, if you're bullish, you would buy or go long, as it were. So the exchange can set that up for both of them, independently, if you like. And the futures price is $20,000 per contract. Now, essentially, what are we doing here? What that means is 10 things. When the contract expires or closes, which could be weeks or months away, the price will be above that level. Zoe thinks it'll be below that level. So in essence, this is a way to kind of bet on where the price will be in a few months' time. Now, how will we know? Good question. Take a look at that right now. So the whys and hows. So just a reminder, Tim is betting that the Bitcoin price will be higher than the settlement price, whatever that is, or well, we need an answer to what that is in a moment. Zoe is betting that the price will be lower than the same settlement price. Point of this, neither party needs to hold Bitcoins, open a wallet or any of that. This is a completely separate market. Now, some key facts. There needs to be a minimum bet size, and this is enough to exclude certain people, even if the risk isn't enough to do it by themselves. So on the CBOE, it's just one Bitcoin at the moment. On the CME, five Bitcoin, all right, which makes the minimum uh, bet, if you like, quite sizable. The settlement price. This is how we're going to know who's won or lost, if you like. This is the thing we're going to compare to the contract price to get a winner or a loser. Now, different exchanges use different prices. So the CBOE have opted to use the price from a trusted source called the Gemini Exchange. The CME have gone for an average of several Bitcoin reference prices. All right, but they need to strike a price they can compare that original contract price to, to say, yes, Tim, you were right, or Zoe, you were right, and then work out who pays whom and how much. So what happens next? Rolling my little example forward. Basically this. So we've got the same situation. All right, we've got Tim and Zoe. And remember, basically, if the futures price was $20,000 per contract, and the settlement price, that's that thing I talked about that we're going to draw off the Gemini exchange or take as an average of some other reference prices in the market, is $25,000 per contract. Essentially, somebody's won the difference and somebody's lost the difference. In this instance, the price did rise. Tim was right when he opened his position in the futures market. Zoe was wrong. So in a nutshell, Zoe needs to pay somebody that new price, $25,000. In a slightly simplified example here, and that will go to Tim, the winner, if you like. Now, in a moment, we'll work out their overall profit or loss. It's not that difficult. Okay, if you open a bet at 20,000, it closes at 25, you've made five. More about that in a moment. Now, leverage. So this is what makes this doubly dangerous, if you like, or doubly exciting, depending on your perspective. So what would that do to the picture? Same scenario. Tim wants to bet on rising prices, buying five Bitcoin futures. All right. Now let's assume that he doesn't have to put down, and this is something in the futures market that makes it different to the Bitcoin market itself, he doesn't have to pay the full contract price. So he's not going to hand over, if you like, $100,000, five times 20 at the start. He's just going to put down on the table at the exchange, the central clearer, if you like, a deposit. And that is going to be 20%. Who says 20%? 
the exchange does. All right. So 20% could be more, could be less, probably more. $4,000 per contract, $20,000. That deposit goes down to place a bet worth, if you want to see it this way, $100,000, five times 20. Zoe, at the start, no one knows who's going to win or lose, has to do the same thing. Deposit goes down a percentage of the opening position. Now, why is that significant? Well, that changes the profit or loss profile in the same scenario. So let's pan forward. Settlement price turns out to be £25,000 per contract. Why has that happened? The price of Bitcoin has moved, those reference rates have moved, and therefore the settlement price has moved. Now, why is that important? Well, Tim's profit is the difference between the original contract price and the settlement price. So 20 plus 25 is $5,000 in his favour. But it was five contracts, all right? So that's a $25,000 profit, not a $5,000 profit, if you like. His deposit, though, was only 20 to get on the table. So his return, if you want to see it that way, on his original investment is 125%, all right? And that is significantly more than you get by buying $100,000 worth of Bitcoin in the same example at the start. Zoe's loss, this is the bad news for Zoe, she only paid a deposit $20,000. I've simplified the example very slightly. She lost $25,000 in total. Her losses are therefore 125% of her original deposit. All right, and to make sure she honours that bet, doesn't just walk away, so we're not paying that, the exchange will have margined her, as they call it, as this contract has remained open. So they have a safety mechanism built in, but for my simplified example, she's lost and she's lost big. And she's lost bigger than she would have done in what's called the cash underlying market. That's true of all futures, by the way. Gearing, accelerates returns, and accelerates potential losses. Now, why not just trade Bitcoins? Just to go back to that point, uh, if you think Bitcoin prices will rise, you can just buy Bitcoins or just not buy them if you think they'll fall. So, futures advantages. Exchanges are regulated, and people actually do quite like that. In other words, you know who you're dealing with, there is a central counterparty guaranteeing trades. Not true in the Bitcoin market itself. Only members can trade. Central counterparty guarantees, as I mentioned, so underpinning these contracts, making sure people don't walk away from the table. All right. The ability to bet on falling as well as rising prices. So this opens up a mechanism for the first time for big institutions, if you like, to bet on falling prices. Incredibly dangerous thing to do, but those are institutions backed by vast amounts of capital and so on. So up to them, I guess. And the infrastructure is familiar to people who already trade futures, because the futures market's been around donkey's years for all sorts of other things that have nothing to do with Bitcoin. So leverage. This is the final point, if you like. Tim could have bought five Bitcoin for $20,000 each or $100,000 in total. This is going back to my, you know, why not just trade the Bitcoin? We could have done that, could have bought Bitcoin. If the price had then risen, $25,000 per coin, his profit is 25,000, not bad. That's a return of 25%. But remember, in the futures market, we said it was a return of 125% because of leverage, and that's a much bigger profit. In other words, his bang per buck has gone up sharply in the futures market. In addition, he didn't have to get involved in actually trading Bitcoins. In addition, he knows there is that central counterparty guarantee that will ensure that Zoe pays. Now, just the final point here. Futures allow lots and lots of people to all interact and bet against each other, if you like, without having to buy and sell the underlying asset, in this case, Bitcoin. Just show you how that works. People sometimes think, is this just a way for two people to play? No. So, let's say the Bitcoin futures price is $20,000, if you like. Very simple example. So Paul, thinking the price will rise further, buys a contract at 20. Tim takes two to tango, sells at 20. And this is the point. The futures market opens up the possibility of people actually actively betting against each other, not just saying, I'm not going to buy. That's my way of thinking the price will fall, if you see what I mean. So we've got a buyer and a seller, a long and a short, a bull and a bear. Now, the price moves. That settlement price, that reference price, moves to $25,000. Now, at this point, Tim thinks, hmm, this is not necessarily working out. I thought the price would fall, it's risen, so I'm getting out now. I want to close my position. I need to buy a contract, having sold one, to do that. Zoe, meantime, comes into the market as a new seller, thinking, well, the price has peaked, I'll now sell a contract, do that dangerous thing of betting on falling prices. Roll forward, the price moves to $30,000. What price? The Bitcoin price, and therefore the reference rate I mentioned. And therefore, what happens next? Well, at this point, Paul thinks, brilliant, I'm cashing in. So he sells a contract gets him off the table, if you like. He's closed his position. Zoe wants out at this point too, thinking I didn't get the direction right either. Net effect, three people have been able to place bets on the direction of Bitcoin, potentially all at different times, if you like. Overall, we've got a profit of 10,000, sorry about a little error there, profit of $10,000 for Paul, let's correct that, 
a loss of five for Tim and a loss of five for Zoe. So everyone's square, Paul's happy, Zoe and Tim much less so. And everyone's been forced to deliver on their obligation. So there's no danger in a futures market, really, of Paul not getting paid his profits, let's put it that way. So what next? Basically, futures market's not perfect. Yes, they're regulated, but there are still things that need to be resolved and things that could still basically you know, almost crash the market. Hopefully not. Let's, let's hope that uh, these have been thought through. Trading and position limits, that's, you know, how many contracts can you actually place as a bet or at what's reasonable. Margin requirements, 20%, is that right? 30%, 40%? Who knows? That will vary. That will be a matter of um, trialling and testing, if you like. There's no university agreed reference price. You saw that already in terms of who's won, who's lost and how much. The price used is different for each exchange. There's an obvious way to arbitrage the cash and futures market. That's a really spotty point, but it matters in terms of price discovery. Less said about that probably right now, the better. Email me to find out more. And policing manipulation may be hard as a result. That's all I'll say on that point for now. Now, on the flip side, if you like, so these are sort of teething problems, things that need to be ironed out. It is the first step towards, towards some sort of mature market, cryptocurrencies. Big institutions will be able to come in and sort of short Bitcoin if they want to. Dangerous though that may be. So it does create some degree of two-way market and it creates it for some big money flows potentially. But it will invite heavier regulatory scrutiny. And no one knows quite what that regulation will look like, when it will, be, uh, when it will impact and what effect it will have. So it creates risk in a way in the underlying market, even though that underlying market is theoretically separate to the one I'm describing right here. Find out more about a complex topic editor.kilic.com and if you'd like to see some other videos on some simpler aspects of Bitcoin, Bitcoin basics, kilic.com forward slash learn.